And stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of The Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. 30 seconds until hour number one from Mark. That was our final verbal time check for The Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. We'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before. When talking about the prosperity gospel, what do we make of it? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Friends, we're going to have a really important eye-opening, edifying, scripture-based, truth-based, spirit-led broadcast. That's our goal as we tackle some controversial issues. And let me be as plain as I can. Number to call 866-34-TRUTH. Calls today only relating to today's subject matter. 866-348-7884. Let me be as clear as I can be with you as we talk about the prosperity gospel as we talk about a recent interview with Kenneth Copeland that's creating a lot of discussion and controversy. Let me tell you who I'm, I'm looking at right now. In my mind's eye, I'm looking into the eyes of Jesus. In other words, I'm accountable to the Lord. I'm not trying to appease a critic. I'm not trying to please a friend. I, I am not thinking about what other human beings have to say. I'm thinking about the fact that I'm a servant of the Lord and I must give account to him. And as a shepherd in the body, I'm not a pastor of a local church, but I'm a leader in the body that speaks to many, is able to reach millions of people for the gospel. I have a sacred responsibility to the shepherd in terms of how I influence the sheep. James, Jacob, chapter three says, not many of you should be teachers because teachers will be more accountable for what they say. It, when a pastor gets up on a Sunday morning and opens the scriptures and teaches you what the scriptures mean, that is a high responsibility. When you call me with your questions and are wrestling through things, and I do my best to answer in a responsible way, that's something that I do in the fear of God, and I don't do lightly. And I'm, I'm going to do my best to avoid just giving you my opinion on something. I want to speak as definitively as I can and leave gray areas gray and make black areas black and white areas white. All right. I have a letter, uh, an email from Justin Peters that he sent me today. If you don't know Justin Peters, uh, he has spent years working against word of faith teaching. Uh, he would say that, for example, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and many others are, are heretics and are, are not, are not saved men. We've had some interaction over the years. We called the show once we talked, uh, he has no problem whatsoever saying that he believes Kenneth Copeland is demon-possessed. And uh, with his permission, I'm going to read to you the email that he sent, because I want you to hear his perspective. I want you to hear his perspective. All right, now, let me lay out a few parameters for you, because this is really, really important. And, and I'm not just addressing this issue and this interview, all right? I'm looking at larger controversies within the body and doing my best to help model something in a way that is constructive for the glory of God. Okay, and we've got some clips I'll play, probably starting the next segment, some clips that I want to play for you. All right, but number one, if you want to know what I believe and what I teach, it's not hard to find out, okay? Don't say, well, you did an interview on this radio station, or you appeared on this show, or or so-and-so is a friend of a friend of yours. Okay, you want to know what I believe. You want to know what's important to me. You want to know what I hold to. I've written more than 35 books. You can find out what I believe. Okay, it's not, it's not hidden. All right, let's go, let's, let's go further. I've been on live daily talk radio one to two hours a day for 11 straight years. How many thousands of hours of radio is that? My beliefs are well known, what I believe about who Jesus is, about the nature of salvation, the nature of scripture, and on and on and on and on. Oh, if that's not enough, we also have 
what, thousands of articles now on a wide range of subjects posted online, all available for free reading. And God knows how many hundreds of sermons are out there as well. So if you want to know what I believe, it's easy to find out. Now, I have issues with hypercharismatics, and I have issues with hypercritics. I have primarily addressed in writing my issues with hypercharismatics and errors within the charismatic camp. I have focused more on that than dealing with the critics because I myself am a charismatic Pentecostal. So these are the circles in which I largely travel. Now, I teach at seminaries that are not charismatic. I preach in settings that are not charismatic. But primarily, for decades, I've been in charismatic Pentecostal circles. So, for example, my 1991 book, Whatever Happened to the Power of God, has the subtitle as The Charismatic Church Slain in the Spirit or Down for the Count. My more recent book came out last year, Playing with Holy Fire, A Wake-Up Call to the Charismatic Pentecostal Church. That deals with those issues, focuses on them. Now, many other books I've written, for example, Hyper Grace, that's dealing with an era that is primarily in charismatic Pentecostal circles. The way I've addressed it, what I've focused on, Hyper Grace, primarily there. All right. Uh, my book, How Saved Are We? My book, Ended the American Gospel Enterprise, and uh, It's Time to Rock the Boat. Other books dealt primarily with abuses within the charismatic Pentecostal movement because that's where I primarily travel and that's where I can speak as an insider. At the same time, there is a danger to hypercriticism. There is a danger of, of those that just think they can judge everyone and they often judge superficially and inaccurately. And I have a whole book, Authentic Fire, which responds to John MacArthur's Strange Fire, all right? But my primary focus in dealing with error is not to expose the error of cessationism, which is a serious biblical error. It is not primarily to confront the hypercritics who do a lot of destructive damage, but primarily to deal with abuses within the charismatic Pentecostal movement. But again, if you want to know what I believe, if you want to know what I hold to, if you want to know what's important to me, it, it's there. It, it's in books. And if you think that you are going to make an evaluation of me based on a tweet or someone's out-of-context YouTube clip, then I don't respect the seriousness of your quest. There is one hypercritical website. I won't mention it by name because I have no desire to give it exposure. I, I don't visit there. I don't look there every so often. Someone will send me something. You got to see the latest thing. It is so lacking in integrity. It is so full of factual error. It is so off the wall. And yet it is anonymous. It's all anonymous. There's no accountability. And I, I ended up blocking these folks on, on Twitter some time back. And, and, and what I told them was this. I, I, I told them this. Listen. You tell me who you are, and I will interact with you. But if I have no idea who you are, you could be some 18-year-old troll out there who just gets a kick out of blasting others. You could be a pastor that committed adultery, never repented, and has been excommunicated by your denomination, and, and, and you're out there attacking. Or you could be someone that hosted the wackiest doctrine that if it was held up to scrutiny, you wouldn't last three minutes. So when there's no accountability, it's one thing if you're doing secret ministry in North Korea, all right, and, and to reveal your identity could cost you your life. I respect that. But it's another thing when you're going to blast others by name and will not even reveal your own identity. Sorry, you lose my respect in the process. Now, a couple of the things I want to say. We are going to address head on the issue of the prosperity gospel. And we're going to play a couple of quotes from this Kenneth Copeland interview that I want to focus on. The purpose of this broadcast is not for Dr. Michael Brown to sit in judgment of Kenneth Copeland and give a full assessment of his ministry. Or if, if, if I felt called and burdened to do that, then I would do the necessary investigation and do the work on that. I have a busy life, as you can imagine. I, I do three or four full-time jobs every single week in ministry and have and, and are focused on quite a few issues. So I have to focus on what I feel the Lord wants me to. So I, the, the goal is not, all right, we're going we're gonna to see what Mike Brown has to say about Kenneth Cole. No, no, I, I'll, I'll give you my understanding of things. And then I'm going to read a very, very strong email from Justin Peters. Okay. I'm, I'm going to read that email. But here's, here's what I take issue with. Are you ready? And, and I'm, I'm just, my goal here again is I want to make this a teachable moment. 
All right. I want to make this a teachable moment. I get asked, why won't you call this one a false teacher? Why won't you call this one a false prophet? Why won't you do it? Well, are you aware that for the critics asking me to call out this charismatic and that charismatic, that there are charismatics wanting me to call out this critic and this critic? Here, I, I do a debate with Sonny Hernandez about limited atonement. Did Jesus die to make salvation possible for the whole world, or did Jesus die exclusively to save the elect? Well, according to Sonny, I'm not saved because I don't believe in limited atonement, all right? On the flip side, my, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. James White, he's told me that churches will not have him because he's a Calvinist and therefore he's a heretic and therefore he's not saved, all right? I got people on either side damning the others to hell. Here, was it last year and a half ago, uh, Todd Friel had Phil Johnson on the air with him and they concluded that I was dangerous and questioned whether I was saved. I feel bad for them when they do that. I don't question whether they are saved. As far as I know, they're, they're, they're born again believers and we'll spend eternity together. And maybe the day will come that, that we'll laugh about the comments that they made, et cetera. All right, I've got no animosity towards them. I'm upset with them. And I took it the opposite way. Yeah, I'm dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. So bring it on, dangerous Dr. Brown. I have people writing me, how come you're not damning John MacArthur? He's not saved. He says you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved. He's not saved. I'm not responding to the noise on either side. And as I understand it, this is the way I use the word. Jesus says a false prophet is a wolf in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7. A false prophet, according to the New Testament, is not a believer, a brother or sister in Jesus, who wrongly prophesies. The Lord told me it's going to rain tomorrow, and it doesn't rain. The Lord told me that, that Barack Obama is going to come back and be president. Wrong. Not true. I don't call that person a false prophet if they're truly saved. I say they are prophesying falsely. They are not a prophet, and they should shut their mouths. That's what I say. All right? So I understand false prophet based on New Testament usage to refer to a non-believer who is leading others astray, who is a wolf in sheep's clothing. All right, not someone who prophesies mistakenly, but they are born again and they hold to biblical orthodoxy. They, are, they prophesied wrongly, they need to shut their mouths, okay? And especially in the New Testament when anyone can potentially prophesy. At the same time, the term false teacher to me is not, well, look, I get people telling me you're going to hell because you deny the preacher of rapture. This, this is every day by the minute on, the, on YouTube, I have people damning others to hell back and forth and damning me to hell. False teachers, I understand it, Second Peter 2, is someone who introduces damnable heresy. Not an error of emphasis on a secondary doctrine, but someone who is bringing in damnable heresy, so if you believe that, you go to hell. All right, we're just getting started. We'll play some clips when you come back. Zivuv. Zivuv. A fly. Fly. You say, what are you going to talk about in the Hebrew word of the day about a fly? Well, we'll start Old Testament. We'll go to New Testament. Here's where we start. There's one verse in many of our English translations, King James and many of our English translations, that starts with the words dead flies. And, and in Hebrew, the word fly comes first. So flies of death dead flies. That's how it's translated. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary, the ointment of the perfumer, to send forth a stinking smell. So does a little folly affect someone who has a reputation for wisdom and honor. So what a great picture from Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1. The perfume you work so hard. Some perfumes are mega expensive, right? A dead fly drops in there and dies. Yeah. There's a stink that comes from it. That's what happens in our lives. That's what happens in our lives when we can have a reputation for wisdom. And you spend years and years working on your reputation, years and years and years, gaining respect, gaining honor, and then you mess up badly and, and you do something unwise and foolish, a little folly, and it can spoil your whole reputation. So remember, dead flies. You know, in the New Testament, that, that Satan is referred to as, as Beelzebub or Beelzebul. There are different traditions in terms of what this comes from, but one view is 
it is a disparaging word, meaning Lord of the Flies, a disparaging title, meaning Lord of the Flies. There's another that associates with dung, Lord, Lord of the, the dung pile. But if it is, in fact, Zavub, Be'el Zavub, all right, then that would mean Be'elzebub, right? Lord of the flies, a mocking, oh, the great and mighty Satan, you are just the Lord of the flies. That, in fact, is a biblical perspective. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Right, let, me, uh, let me make one more statement, 866-34-TRUTH. If you have a question for me or want to weigh in on the issue of false teachers, if you want to weigh in on the issue of prosperity gospel, etc., phone lines are open, but we're restricting calls to the subject matter today. I want to say one last thing. Then I want to play a couple of clips from the interview with Kenneth Copeland. I have written categorically, strongly, as recently as last year as a major portion of one of my books against the carnal prosperity message. I want to make that very clear. We're going to play a couple of clips. Then I want to read to you what Justin Peters wrote, okay? Justin Peters would be maybe the foremost critic of the Word of Faith movement today. I want to read what he sent to me today with his permission, all right? But I, I want to just make one more statement. If you've been following things on Twitter, you see that I had blocked Justin Peters and he emailed me today. And there's a reason I blocked him. One was that any time a charismatic leader would make some controversial comment or something would happen, it would be the latest video attacking this or that, that w with great regularity, Justin would copy me and what about this and when are you going to call this out? Listen, I, I do not copy every Southern Baptist leader and say, hey, when are you going to call out this abuse? When are you going to address this problem? When are you going to address that problem? All right, it's just, it's, it's not what I'm going to do, nor is it my calling to respond to folks who will never be satisfied with where I stand unless I damn to hell some folks that I know are godly men and women. I'm not mentioning names at this moment. Okay, so who are you talking about? I'm just, just telling you that there are critics that have told me over the phone, right in my ear, that so-and-so is a false teacher, and if they died right now, they'd go to hell. And I know these people love Jesus, and I would, tr I would trust some of these people 10,000 times more than I would trust some of the critics damning them to hell. And, and these folks are busy pursuing Jesus and reaching the lost and making a difference. Their last concern is that this critic or that critic attack. So I was constantly getting dragged in. Justin is a gentleman in the midst of our differences. He's, he's, he's going to be gracious and seek to be upright. But the flood of trash, the flood of ugliness, the flood of, I'm talking about stuff that was as unchristian as you could imagine that would then follow from so-called Christians. Yikes. Are you kidding me? How come you're calling that? Hey, hey I, I just told you. I spent years, I spent decades addressing abuses within my own house. Okay, in writing, I'm not responsible to respond to every critic. Someone on Twitter with zero followers writes, when are you going to address this? Tell you what, when the Lord tells me to, because I'm busy doing his work. When he tells me to stop doing this, to address that one, I'll do it. But I, I, I give you an example. All right. Justin posted the other day that I claimed, when I went on Benny Hinn's show, I claimed to be ignorant to Benny Hinn's teachings. That's, that's not correct. That's not accurate. As I wrote to him today, that's not accurate. Here's what happened. I had played clips on my show of teachings from Benny Hinn that I found to be dangerous and wrong and erroneous. Okay, clips, I played. Little gods, your little gods and other stuff like that. I, I played clips, I critiqued it. A grad from my ministry school that had spent many, many months traveling with Benny Hinn said, Dr. Brown, I think you should really get to know him because the stuff he doesn't teach anymore and, and other things he no longer holds to. So I got online and I saw well, here he repudiated this message here and he repudi repudiated that message there. I thought, all right, well, I don't know what to make of it. I then got an invitation to come on a show and one of the subjects we were going to discuss was hyper grace. And I thought, okay, if I can reach his audience and talk about hyper grace, because he's got a big TBN audience in other places, it might be worth it. Let me, let me pray about it. Let me think about it. Then I talked to others close to him. And I said, look, this is important to me. 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 I differ with this, with this, with this. And they said, Dr. Brown, 
you'll find that Benny Hinn agrees with this and this and this and this. And you may have heard this about him, but it's either in the past and he doesn't hold to it anymore or it's been exaggerated. So because I get lied about all the time and misrepresented, I thought, here's what I'm going to do. I got this invitation. I'm going to get to spend time with him one on one. I am going to walk through that door to reach his audience and then make a fresh evaluation. In other words, I know all the evidence is not ignorant. I know all this evidence against him. I played clips from it on the air in the past to critique. And now I'm having others that I trust saying that's not accurate, that's not true, et cetera. So what did I do? I said, all right, I'm going to go in with a clean slate as if I don't know anything. It's not ignorant. That was my strategy. I'm going to go in. I've heard the negative. I've heard people saying that he's repented of the negative or the negative is exaggerated. I'll go in face to face. All right. And ultimately, though, four shows were aired talking about Messianic prophecy and other things. The Hyper Grace show never aired. If I knew that show was not going to air, I would not have done the interview. Was it a mistake to do the interviews anyway? Maybe. Could be. Could well be. My friend, Dr. James, this side, that side, let, let me go in and, and let the man speak for himself. And then I followed up with a private letter to him, raising some serious differences and, and urging him to call out certain people for, for carnal fundraising and other things like that. Okay. And I did that privately and that's the only contact. That's where it ended. Okay. I don't know whatever happened after that. And I've had no contact since. And if I was invited on the air tomorrow with him, I wouldn't do it. Okay. But I did it strategically then. Was it a right move or not? Maybe a wrong move, but I did it with a pure heart to honor the Lord. All right. And I did it to try to reach other people. And I hope you would want me to do the same with you. All right. If, if you had a mountain of evidence against you, but, but others were saying, no, no, it's not true. He's repented of that. And you said, Dr. Brian, can we talk face to face? I would hope that you'd say, yeah, well, let, let's do that and sort things out. All right. So Kenneth Copeland is classic word of faith teacher. So he refers to Oral Roberts as a mentor. Uh, he would have come out of teaching from Kenneth Hagin. Now, interesting, Kenneth Hagin put out a book later in life about the miser's touch, warning that the message of prosperity had, had gone off the rails, that the message of God providing and, and blessing his people so that they can be a blessing to others, that that message had gone off the rails. And in going off the rails, he was now warning about it and saying there's danger. But Word of Faith teachers would emphasize the power of confession that we speak the word, that our reality is determined by what the word says, not by, by what circumstances say, that when Jesus died on the cross, he not only paid for our sins, but our sicknesses, so that because he already died on the cross by his stripes were healed, we're already healed and we just have to appropriate it, that words have power, that we can create certain realities with our words, etc. And some hold to a terribly defective view of atonement. It might, uh, others hold to a view of atonement that is absolutely heretical. And others are believers that I've known for decades that are mainstream believers that emphasize certain points. All right, so I want to focus on two parts of this interview with Kenneth Copeland, where the discussion comes up about living a wealthy lifestyle and prospering. Here's the first clip. All right. The blessing of Abraham. Abraham was extremely wealthy, and he had a covenant with God. Not the, it's not the Jewish blessing, it's the Abrahamic blessing. God, I get excited talking about it because I love it. And I started out deep in debt with nothing. Galatians chapter 3. If you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise and his promise was great wealth. All right. So he's explaining his theology, why he believes that God blesses his people with wealth, that it is a covenant blessing. And then he's asked directly about the way he lives and being a wealthy man personally. So let's listen to his response when he's asked directly, well, how about the way you live what about your wealth? Isn't that wrong for a preacher? Here's his response. You are living yes. a life of luxury. Yes, You've am. got great homes. You've got yes, great planes. Do. You, you drive in limos. I'm a and very wealthy man. You're a very wealthy man. Yes. Yeah. And some and people I'm would not, say I'm that, is it, is it appreciated? May, may I add something to that? Uh, I, I, my wealth doesn't come from offerings alone. 
You I sell things, right. books and DVDs. Yes, and I have a lot of natural gas on our property. Now, one friend of mine told me that over the years, Kenneth Copeland's ministry has donated more than $50 million to their outreach overseas. So it's a massive missions organization. Uh, others have told me that he's one of the most generous men on the planet. And others would say, who cares how generous he is? He's fleecing the flock. He's getting wealthy off the, the offerings of, of poor widows. He's misleading people about God's will to heal, et cetera, et cetera. So here's what we're going to do. Second half of the show. I'm going to start with reading the Justin Peters email. Okay. It's a long email. He said, read it in the air. Just read it in full. Great. I'm going to read it in full. Then I'm going to give you my take and how we sort these things out and what our view should be on the message of prosperity. Oh, oh, and what about preachers traveling by private jet? Hey, I flew overseas, business class, Korea. They paid my fare overseas instead of like a $2,000 economy ticket. It was maybe a $4,000 business class ticket. But you tell me how you're going to travel 26 and a half hours, get off the plane, and one hour later preach uh, meetings to hundreds or thousands of people and do it two straight days and get on the plane and come back if you're in the back of the plane. They paid their bill, their choice. Is, is that wrong? Is it better to, to, to just fly economy no matter what? Where does one draw the line? Maybe just get a, a more economical airline that has less perks. Where does one draw the line? Serious questions. We're going to have a serious discussion about it. And we're going to be constructive. As I said at the outset, I'm looking at Jesus in my mind's eye. I'm not looking at you, the critic, the charismatic. Fr I'm looking at Jesus. Lord, I want to please you and draw people to you on today's broadcast. We'll be right back. So did God create sin? Does the Bible say that God created evil? If that's the case, wouldn't he then be the author of sin, the author of evil? Wouldn't that be contrary to verses that say that God is light and in him is no darkness at all? Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. And I want to explain how this verse has sometimes been understood to say that God created evil. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, says this. So, King James, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You say, well, there it says create evil. Well, the New King James correctly changes it to create calamity. Other translations say create disaster. So, what in fact is this verse saying? The Hebrew word translated evil in the King James or calamity in the New King James is the Hebrew word ra or ra'a. That word means fundamentally something bad. When human beings do something bad, they commit evil. When God brings something bad on someone, say in judgment, then he is creating calamity. He's not creating evil. The idea that God could do evil or create evil is totally contrary to his nature. Everything he does is good and right. That's why the Bible says that God kills and gives life. He puts to death and gives life, but it doesn't say he murders because murder is the unjust taking of a human life. So, no, God does not create evil. That's a mistranslation in the King James. The Hebrew ra, ra, ra always in this context would mean calamity, disaster, when God will say, you've done ra, 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 you've done evil, so I'm going to bring ra, 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 I'm going to bring calamity, disaster. That's the constant context in which these things are found. And even in the verse itself, it's not opposite, it's not good or bad, but it's shalom, peace, or calamity. God's saying, I'm bring them both. You say, where does evil come from then? That is part of the mystery of free will, be it the free will of the angels in heaven or the free will of, of Adam and Eve on earth, that freedom is given to say yes or no. And if we choose freely to say no, then that actuates evil. Then evil is actuated through the action of our will. And now born in a fallen world, evil is just part of our world, part of our society, part of our human nature from which we need deliverance and forgiveness through the cross. But does God create sin? Is God the author of evil? 
Does the Bible teach that? Absolutely not. He will work through Satan. He will work through demons. He will work through evil in this world to accomplish his purpose. But his purpose is good. He doesn't do evil. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. In Galatians 1, Paul said that if he gets these men, he wouldn't be a servant of the Messiah. Romans 15 does talk about pleasing others, meaning putting others first. But if you're going to please God, you're going to displease a lot of people. If you're going to please God, you're going to get people that love you and people that hate you. My goal is to please the Lord, and by please, pleasing the Lord, I can best serve you. What do we make of the prosperity message? Is there truth in it mixed with error? Is it all heretical? How do we sort that out? And how do we respond to a recent interview with Kenneth Copeland on TV that's going viral online? Justin Peters, a foremost critic of the Word of Faith message, by the way, I've, I've offered to debate him publicly on issues of divine healing and the gifts of the Spirit for today. He's declined that and said he'd debate me on word of faith. I've declined it because I'm not word of faith myself. Why would I debate that when that's not my own position? Okay, so he writes this to me today, and I'm reading it with his explicit written permission. Um, Dear Michael, I hope this finds you well. From a screenshot a friend sent me, I see you have said I have disqualified myself from being taken seriously on the issue of Kenneth Copeland. Um, as I told Justin, I'll correct this. No, I didn't say he had disqualified himself from being taken seriously about Kenneth Copeland. I said from taking, being taken seriously, period. In other words, he's posted things about me that have been accurate. He, he has, uh, when I've emailed at length to his concerns and never get a response back, that's why I made that statement. I didn't say that he can't comment about Copeland or not, never made that statement. He said, I would have tagged you on my tweet except for the fact that you blocked me. Yes, as I explained why, and in particular, the shameful behavior of many of those who follow Justin Peters. That's not his fault, but it is shameful to see the behavior of those. And by the way, why in the world would I, would I go out of my way to address a critic that, and I'm not talking about Justin Peters, okay? I'm not talking about anyone you know by name. There's some generic person out there. They don't pray for me. They don't fast for our ministry. They don't contribute to our ministry. They don't sacrifice to help us reach people around the world. Why in the world would I try to appease them when I won't appease them as long as I'm till, still a tongues-talking believer in the power of the Spirit, okay, I won't appease them until I, I damn people to hell that I know are, are true believers, all right? Why in the world would I do that? And, and then in doing that, I'm not going to be able to edify you and bless you and help you and teach you and, and, and deal with other areas of real concern. All right, now I'm going to read on. Justin said this, I mentioned that you would call Copeland a brother for the simple fact that I know your opinion carries much weight in the charismatic world and many charismatics follow me. I absolutely do believe Kenneth Copeland is demon-possessed. This is what Justin Peters wrote, and obviously he'll give account to God. Either God will say, I'm glad you called him out, or God will say, how in the world could you do that about my child? All right? Justin writes this, It troubles me greatly that you would call a man who is as manifestly evil as he a brother. Yes, I know you say you do not agree with all of his teachings, but you still affirm a man who is quite likely the most brazen and obvious false prophet in the entire history of the charismatic church, a brother. He has uttered the most vile and despicable heresies imaginable, and to make matters worse, exponentially worse, has attributed these same heresies to God himself. He claims that God gave him the heresies he spews. He unashamedly teaches prosperity theology. He unashamedly exploits the poor, sick, and widows for personal financial gain. He unashamedly blames the sick for being sick. If someone is sick, it is his or her own fault. He has been challenged literally for decades now and yet remains unrepentant. Okay, so let me just say this. If everything Justin Peters said there is accurate, if Copeland has uttered the most vile and despicable heresies imaginable and has knowingly and willingly exploited the, exploited the poor and widows and has blamed the sick for being sick, yes, then the man is a false prophet, a false teacher, or heretic. Okay? If, if everything Justin says here is accurate, if this is an accurate assessment, then yes, Kenneth Copeland is not a brother. If that assessment is accurate, all right? He continues, if Kenneth Culpin is not a false prophet, then the word truly has no meaning. If Kenneth Culpin is not a false prophet, then no one is. You will not even call Todd Bentley a false teacher, a man who claims to kick elderly women in the face with his biker boot, literally has kicked a man in the gut with stomach cancer, 
doubling them over in pain. I have that on video. It's not enough to criticize aspects of their teachings, Michael. These are wolves. They are predators. Now, again, it's not my job to respond to every complaint in the body, which come to me every day, sometimes by the hundreds, sometimes by the thousands. What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? Will you call this one out? Will you call that one out? Okay. That's, that's not my job or my calling. I'm not God's policeman. When I'm burdened about an issue, I address it by name, specifically, write whole books about it in detail. Again, if you want to know what I believe, read the books. So I don't support Todd Bentley's ministry. I have profound differences with him. But those that have known him for years said that he's a saved man following Jesus. I don't know that he's not. Therefore, I don't call him a false teacher. But I have strong differences. Don't support his ministry. Said that publicly for years. End of subject. Okay, we go on. He says, I'm very willing to call these wolves out and very willing to state that they are unregenerate. I have no prick of conscience whatsoever saying they are not believers. It matters not that they have a statement of faith that would pass a basic doctrinal smell test. They are wicked to see charlatans and heretics. One of the great ironies in this movement is those who claim to have the highest view of the Holy Spirit and the most emphasis on him actually have the lowest view of the Holy Spirit. All word faith and most charismatics would look at me as a cessationist and say, I do not believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. To the contrary, I am so confident in the power of this indwelling third person of the triune God that I do not believe someone can be indwelt by him and teach the heresies these men teach, offer the false prophecies that these men offer, and exploit the poor and sick people that they exploit and do so with no prick of their conscience whatsoever, even after myriads of people have called them to repent. I have too much confidence in the sanctifying work of God's illumined word by the Holy Spirit to believe someone such as Copeland, Bentley, Johnson, Hinn, etc., are indwelt by him. My view of the Holy Spirit is far too high to allow for this. Hey, Justin, you'll live and die before God with that, all right? Probably of those you mentioned, I've never met Kenneth Cole, but may have shaken his hand once at a big meeting with a bunch of people, but, but otherwise never met him. Um, Bill Johnson, I've got more of a friendship with. We've been together over the years, and, and I don't question Bill's salvation for, for a split second. So if you're, Justin, you're sure enough to say that they're all unsaved going to hell if they were to die right now, that's between you and God, all right? That's between you and God. But I'm not going to prove my orthodoxy by agreeing with you, okay? That's not how it works. You want to know what I believe? Read what I believe. Listen to what I believe. Watch what I believe. That's where we lay it out. I believe denying the gifts and power of the Spirit at work today, which are literally touching and healing and delivering millions of people around the globe, attested, documented miracles that are leading people out of darkness to follow Jesus. All right, hear me, okay? That are leading people who are Muslims, atheists, Buddhists, who are drug addicts, who are prostitutes, terrorists, and by encounters with the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. I'm not mentioning other names here, but people that I know, that I have known for many, many years, who preach a simple, clear gospel message, whom critics have damned to hell, that those critics denying the work of the Holy Spirit on the earth today, which is glorifying Jesus and setting captives free by the millions around the globe, even as I speak, the Holy Spirit is doing these things and working these miracles in Jesus' name, according to the scriptures. I will debate that with anyone, anytime, that divine healing is for today, according to the scriptures, as a normative pattern, according to the Bible. Whether I never see a sick person healed or not, I believe it because it's written. And I'll debate that with anyone, anytime, in a fair setting. If they are a, a, a true representative of their position that has respect in their community, I'll debate them. If not, it's a waste of time because you demolish someone's view that no one respects anyway. But to me, it's a shocker that someone could claim to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and deny what that Holy Spirit is doing to the glory of Jesus' name around the globe today. That's grievous. That's grievous. And yet, I don't question that Justin's saved. I don't question that he's a child of God. I don't question that he wants to please the Lord and do the will of God. He's just in serious error on aspects of the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. And other things, he's done a great job of critiquing some real abuses and some real problems. Okay, back to his email, which is almost done. He says about all the above, they are hell-bound deceivers. I pray that God would grant them repentance, 2 Timothy 2, but I fear that it is these whose judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep, 2 Peter 2, 3. I would love to be wrong. I actually do pray for them. I'm glad you do, Justin. That's, that's meaningful. I mean that from the heart. From the screenshot sent to me, you think I should have emailed you first. I have asked you in several emails to strongly renounce these people, but you will not do so. 
You will critique here and there, but you will not call a spade a spade. I intended in my tweet to do that and to make the distinction between our two positions clear. I did not disparage you. I said, I call your brother. I obviously, I, I said, you call him a brother. I obviously do not. Again, I've emailed back at length when Justin's written to me and not gotten a response. I've said, let's have a public debate on differences. But no, listen, I, I'm doing my best right now to look at Jesus, not to look at anybody else, right? In my mind's eye, to look at him. He is the one who's going to decide who's saved and who's not saved. And unless I have hardcore evidence that someone denies fundamentals of the gospel and is therefore a heretic or is living a sinful life, thereby denying the gospel, I will not call that person a hellbound sinner or say that that person right now is a false teacher. I'll say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And I'll do it in book length form. And I'll take on issues. You know how many, you know how many people in, in the hyper grace camp or the hyper prosperity camp are upset with me? And that, so be it. So be it. And I lay it out with quotes, with details. Do you know that we are currently working with Nigeria? In fact, we'll, you'll get an email maybe next month where we're seeking to raise money to help a publisher in Nigeria publish Playing with Holy Fire, Hyper Grace, and Can You Be Gain Christian? And Playing with Holy Fire has a whole chapter on the pep talk, uh, the, the pep talk prosperity gospel, and another whole chapter on mercenary prophets, and another whole chapter on sexual immorality. And on and on it goes. On and on it goes. Head on, forthright. Because as God is moving mightily in Nigeria, heresy is spreading in Nigeria, and we're doing our best to address it. All right. Justin says this, I've commended you before in ably defending things like penal substitutionary atonement. You have done so flawlessly. It is why I wish you would be equally clear thinking in this. Millions are being deceived by those you affirm as brothers. Millions, they're being led to hell by these men and some women. You need to speak of these wolves with the same clarity with which the Bible speaks of them. All right, so again, my mission is to honor the Lord and to please the Lord, not any critic, however sincere they may be. What God has called me to do when there are widespread issues in the body is to address the issues, all right? If you're so sure, just, just remember, just remember, if you're so sure about damning this one to hell or that one to hell, just remember that some on the other side are damning you to hell for what you believe. I have folks that have followed Copeland's ministry. I know them, maybe they followed his ministry 30, 40 years. I don't know. And they would say, this email's crazy. I've listened to him daily for years. He teaches the gospel, preaches the gospel, edifies people with the word. Yeah, you may differ with certain points, but what they said about him is crazy. Someone else tweets and says, my mother came to Jesus through Copeland's ministry and is an orthodox believer on all accounts. And someone else just posts something about people being led to the Lord through his ministry around the world. I know people have known him for years, said he's a brother, but we have some serious differences. I'll let God work those out, but we'll address the prosperity gospel question, the last issue now, when we come back. Is Satan everywhere at the same time? Is the devil omnipresent? I see no scriptural emphasis on that or no scriptural backing for that whatsoever. God alone is omnipresent. Angels are not omnipresent. Created beings are not omnipresent. And Satan is both a created being and an angel, a fallen created being, a fallen angel. You know, in Matthew the fourth chapter, Matthew chapter four, verse 11, after Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, it says this, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So Satan left, angels came. Neither of them are omnipresent. Just because Satan is a spirit being and we can't see him, you can have the feeling, well, he's omnipresent. No, only God fills the universe. Uh, only is it said of God in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Only of God, as it says in Jeremiah 23, that he fills heaven and earth. It's not said of Satan. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is a powerful, dark, spiritual being, very powerful, very deceptive, and he has a well-organized army of demon powers under him, whether those are fallen angels or wherever we get the class of demons from, and, and they are sent out. And when we resist demons, we are resisting Satan. When it tells us in 1 Peter 5 to resist Satan, it doesn't mean that each of us is personally resisting him because he's everywhere at the same time. No, he comes and he goes. 
just like in Matthew, the fourth chapter, he leaves and looks for more opportune time. Satan is not omnipresent. Let's not give him credit he doesn't deserve. Only God is almighty. Only God is omniscient. Only God is omnipresent. Absolutely not Satan. It's the line of fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, as, as I said, friends, my goal is to make this whole show a teachable moment. And I'm looking at larger issues of criticism, of abuse, and how we sort those out. I've done whole shows on the prosperity gospel. I have written whole chapters in books about it. But let me say this concisely. If you preach and believe that God blesses his people in many different ways, and that as you honor the Lord and give to him and work hard that he blesses you, I say amen to that. And how many of you would say, yeah, you know, before I started giving generously to my local church, we never had enough money, and I felt the Lord convict me to honor the Lord first, and I started giving it, and we've just been blessed. Or, you know, before we were saved, we just spent all our money on drugs and alcohol and wasted money. Now we honor the Lord, we're frugal, and we, we moved out of this rat-infested apartment. We have a nice house now. Many have testimonies like that. Uh, our friends in India who despise the prosperity message, they say it's, it's the biggest problem right now in the Indian church is the prosperity message. They would be the first to talk about God's provision. They would be the first to talk about how the gospel has swept this unreached area where the people lived in utter poverty and, and, and huts that were falling apart, that they now have wood, these little wood homes. I mean, you wouldn't live in that wood home for a day, okay? But now it's better than the hut they had. We believe that. We believe God is faithful. We believe God provides, all right? We believe that. We preach that. And the New Testament reinforces what's in the Old Testament about given it will be given to you. And there are even financial promises that if you give and honor the Lord, that that as you sow, you'll reap. Those messages are true. The carnal prosperity message says that Jesus died to make you financially rich. That is bogus, that is erroneous, that is heretical, that is an affront to the cross. Jesus did not die on the cross to make you financially rich. Plenty of saints around the world have been poor and have died in poverty and have died in the midst of persecution and have literally run, running, from, from, uh, running for their lives have had to eat grass to survive, and they have been saints blessed by God. And Paul himself talks about knowing how to abound, but also knowing how to be abased and going around hungry and without adequate clothing and on and on, and that was for the gospel. Sometimes following Jesus means you lose everything. Sometimes following Jesus means that everything you have in this world is given up, uh, Hebrews 10 talks about the believers and losing everything and, and, and doing it joyfully for the gospel. I mean, their, their goods confiscated, but they knew they had better treasure in heaven. The carnal prosperity message says that godliness is a means to financial gain, which Paul categorically rebukes in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter. Now, if you truly believe that the Old Testament promises still apply, that the promises that God gave to Israel now apply to the believers today, that God promised Abraham to bless him and he was a wealthy man, and that wealth is a blessing of the gospel, and that you should say, Lord, I believe you want to make me wealthy so I can help the poor and meet the needs of others and so on. I'm not going to say that's heretical. If you say the purpose of the cross is to make you financially rich, I'll say that's heretical, blatantly outright, no question about it. That is not the gospel. And if you get 10 million people to pray for Jesus to, quote, save them so they can get financially wealthy, that's not the gospel, and that's not salvation. And David Wilkerson, for whom I preached 40, 50 times in the 90s, like 91 to 95, he's on record as saying that the carnal prosperity message is birthed in the pit of hell, and I fully agree with that. But I see that as very different from someone who has an error in their thinking and who doesn't realize that our heart is not an earthly possession. Now, now, here's the other thing. I have no issue with someone being blessed. I have no issue with someone being blessed. 
that here, how, how many Christian businessmen do you know that love Jesus? Maybe you're one of them, businessman, businesswoman. You love Jesus, you honor the Lord, and he's blessed your business. And now you've got more money to give to missions and more money to help uh, projects for the poor and also your own lifestyles improve. Praise God. I rejoice with you. But if you have your heart and earthly riches, and if you hear a message that gets you to put your heart in earthly riches, and now it's the whole message is money comes to me, now you're carnal, now you're in the wrong place. Now, let me say one more thing. I've watched this with my own eyes. There are many who thought that the poorer you are, the holier you are. Like, like the church in which I was saved, they used to joke that the pastor's so holy, he's got holes in his shoes. And that the whole goal was you kept ministers of the gospel poor and struggling. That's not the gospel either. Paul says those who preach the gospel should make their living by the gospel. Jesus says the labor is worthy of his hire. So if you have a, a living that's fair, that's good stewardship based on the income of your ministry, that's righteous and fair, and you've been blessed, maybe you're an author and you've been blessed. I mean, I, I work just about around the clock joyfully. It's a joy. It's an honor. And, and, it, and if, if I receive compensation for that, I was, praise God, what, wonderful. Although we keep constantly trying to put funds back into the gospel. However, if I exploit the poor to get rich, that's sinful. That's ugly. Leonard Gravenhill used to say to me, Mike, just think these big ministries, every dime that comes in from every poor widow, they're going to have to give account to God for it. And, and that helped fuel the fire of my book, How Saved Are We? That type of thinking. And, and, and my chapter in there about carnal prosperity emphasis. If I'm saying to you, hey, get behind our ministry, help our ministry, help our ministry. We got a project here. We're helping the poor in the Philippines and you're pouring in money so I can get rich and we give a little to the Philippines. That's sin. That's despicable. That's ugly. Now, when Kenneth Copeland urges people to give, is he urging them to give so that he can get personally rich? Or is he urging them to give because he believes God's generally going to bless them as they give and he wants to see them blessed? God knows. I don't know and you don't know what's in his heart. God knows. He'll give account to God on that day. Where I differ with emphasis, I'll say it plainly. Now, what, what, about, what about private jets? What about this whole, here, so here, here's a clip, Jesse Duplantis, uh, there, here, there's a, a, a TV show going after him about a private jet. So just watch this little clip here, then I want to comment. Jesse Duplantis zips around in this DeSalt Falcon 50 jet paid for by his church. Here he is boarding the plane with his wife for a short one-hour flight from Fort Worth, Texas to his home outside New Orleans. Estimated round-trip cost, $14,000. If he flew commercial, it would be as low as 180 bucks. All right, so what do we make of that? Okay, here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. It may be, in some cases, very frugal, wise, constructive, excellent stewardship for a ministry to have a private jet. Okay, just like businesses do, it may be frugal, it may be wise, it may be excellent stewardship. You look at it on a business basis, makes perfect sense, okay? And for others, it's an abuse. For others, it's fleecing the flock. When Creflo Dollar put out a request for 64000 excuse me, $64 million for a new jet, I wrote an article why Creflo's not getting any of my dollars. And I understand pressure, and I understand an international schedule, and I understand that the crowds, everyone wanted to get near you, and, and he's a far more famous person on TV, so I understand that, okay? I understand all that. But I made it very clear why I differed with that and why I felt it brought reproach to the gospel. That being said, I said in the same article, it may be good stewardship for a ministry to have a private jet. They often share it with others, and then they break it down or if, in order to get from here to here to here to here and do these meetings and reach all these people that we can't get to these places and do this unless we have a private jet. That's between that organization and God and their givers, okay? Because I don't know. I'm not there to sort that out. This much I know. When I travel overseas, when I go to India every year, when I just went to Korea, we work out a way, the, the ministries, large ministries that bring us over, they automatically pay a business class fare. Otherwise, we work out a way, we, we use miles to upgrade, we look for a good rate to be good stewards because here's the deal. I'm gonna be traveling, say my India trip from when I leave my house to when I get there is about 40 hours, all right? And when I get there, often I get off the plane, I'm gonna be speaking. Well, if I can have a setting where I can lay down, 
and I can rest. And I always have writing deadlines when I could sit and write and have better focus, et cetera. It's a good investment. Instead of paying 2000 for a ticket, we pay 4500 for a ticket. That's a good investment for us. And I feel good about it. And I feel I'm being a great steward. And our team is always looking for the best rate and the best fare, et cetera. When I fly stateside, it's economy. doesn't matter if it's a five-hour flight, it's economy. If I get upgraded, great. Because it's different, I can easily handle it. But what I'm saying is every ministry and organization has to work that out. And then they have to have a board with accountability. Then they have to be able to look their givers in the eye and say, hey, here's the investment. Here's where your money went for us. Our goal is that we want to tip all the money out. All right. So I get a salary, reasonable salary for everything I do. Our staff gets reasonable salaries. Actually, we have to, we have to bump their salaries. They're underpaid. Okay. And, and we, we do what we do. All right. Others would say, well, for what you do, you should get more. That's, that's not the goal. That's not the goal. All right. Every new thing I take on, I don't take a dime more for taking that on. All right. We do what we do. Our goal is to get everything out, 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 out to touch as many people as we can. And I know ministries that bring in tens of millions of dollars, and that's their goal too. That's their goal, is to generate funds to get out and touch the world and glorify Jesus. I am not going to sit here and just swipe back and forth, this is wrong, that's wrong, unless I have factual details and unless it's my job to address that. I don't spend all my time addressing the critics. I don't spend all my time addressing cessationist abuses. I don't spend all my time addressing charismatic abuses. I seek to do what God's called me to do as plainly and clearly as possible. This whole hour, I've had one goal, make this a teachable moment to build the body and glorify Jesus. And we go forward from here.